You can't be authentic until you accept your own uniqueness. Okay. See, they go together. It's like, I have to accept myself and be okay with it. I'm not like, I'm not like Lori, I'm not like you, you're not, not this or that. And if you don't accept that, then you become not authentic in that you're always pretending to be something that you're not. And boy, how much of that do we have? Frankly, I'm tired of the phoniness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just think that especially Christians get this idea that people are not going to think well of them unless they're always okay and mm -hmm. everything's always wonderful. And if you, if you really start thinking about it, almost every person you ask them how they are, oh, I'm fine. Praise the Lord, I'm fine, or I'm good. And you know, I'd say better than 50% of the time, that's just not true. They're going through something, they're hurting, they've got a headache or whatever. And I understand we don't wanna spill our guts to everybody you know, that comes along. And in a way we are fine if we're fine spiritually. But I just think that there's not a lot of real, close, honest relationships anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think if we wanna have better relationships, Laurie says to me, how are you, Joyce? I mean, I should be able to say to her, you know, I went through a real rough time last week, blah, 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 with this and that, and, but I know that God's gonna take care of it. I've been doing a, working on a devotional on Psalms, and it really came clear to me in reading the Psalms. David was so brutally honest with God about how he felt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did not hold back how he felt, but he always ended. The Psalm always ends with, but I know you'll take care of me. I, I know you love me, but I think we need, I just think we need to be more honest with one another. I mean, do we really think that Jonah was fine when he was in the whale's belly <laughs> or that Job was fine when he had all those boils? And so I just think, I think we need to start being more honest. When are you too authentic? Because you even alluded to just now, you said, you know, you don't want to just spill your guts to everyone every time, but there should be a new awareness of authenticity. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's sweeping through. It feels like a very timely, fresh subject mm -hmm. and fresh book. So 100% we need to break this down. Mm -hmm. But you can go too far where you just dread to even ask a person, how are you doing? Because you know you're gonna get yeah. a, a, a big <laughs> uh, regurgitation of bad. Well, there so, is the other side of that where people just do nothing but complain and murmur about everything. And that's another, that's a whole different set of problems than what we're talking about here. And the other reason why people are not honest with each other and authentic is because and I hate to say it this way, but there's just not a lot of people that you can trust anymore right. with your secrets. And so if I say to you, you know, one of my kids is going through something right now and it's really been hard for me, you know, I don't want to say that to you unless I'm pretty sure that you're not going to get on with Facebook or Twitter media. or on mm -hmm. the phone and, oh man, you should hear what, what Joyce is going through. So I think we have a double problem. If we're going to be more authentic with each other, Obviously, you have to pick who you feel like you can trust to do that with. Mm -hmm. Feels like what you're doing is you're wanting to, if we use the old analogy of a road, one ditch right. is basically being a gossip. Right. And the other ditch is being so scared to tell anybody anything that you're going through right that you're cloistered in the ivory tower right. and you never get any help or anything going on. So you've got this, you know, the two ditches. We need to stay on the road yeah. of authenticity. So what is authenticity? You've just written a book about it. What kind of well, give us the the truth about what the what what we're really If wanting. I'm an authentic person, okay. I'm going to be the same in the grocery store, right. in the bank in the supermarket as I am sitting right here on this platform. Okay. I'm not, I'm not gonna say one thing 
when people are watching and then do another when I think nobody's watching because Amen. God is always watching. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had a lot of scathing words for the phonies. Mm -hmm. He did not like phoniness. And that was what he told the real religious scribes and Pharisees. You tell everybody else what to do, but you don't do it yourself. And I think we have, I, you know, I'm a pretty real person anyway, so this is kind of not real hard for me if I could be accused of being, you know, too real sometimes. <laughs> but um, I have a real hard time with people that are always fine and always okay and they never have a problem. And I think those are the kind of people that can really make other people think, I must really be messed up. Mm -hmm. You know, because I've got, I've got some problems, but everybody I talk to is always perfectly fine. And I don't think, the reason why I put those two subjects together is you can't be authentic until you accept your own uniqueness. Okay. See, they go together. It's like, I have to accept myself and be okay with it. I'm not like, I'm not like Lori, I'm not like you, not, not this or that. And if you don't accept that, then you become not authentic in that you're always pretending to be something that you're not. And boy, how much of that do we have? Mm. You know, it's like. Yeah, you know, there's, there's nothing more refreshing than being around someone that you know is going through something really hard, but their attitude they, is, is still upbeat. They still have the joy of the Lord and you know that they're going through some tough stuff. Right. That's what I think is so amazing to be around people that are full of the Holy Spirit, right. that ha still have that peace, they have that calm, and are the same. And I think that's really, you said in a nutshell, what God wants us to show to the world. Yeah. He, he wants us to show them that yes, we have problems just like you do, yeah. but there is a different way to handle those problems. The Apostle Paul never one time told the believers that he would pray for their problems to go away. Hmm. Never, you can't find a place where he said he would pray for their problems to go away. He, he said, he prayed for them that they would bear their trouble with good temper, mm -hmm. that they would maintain a good attitude. So we're not helping anybody, say who doesn't know Jesus, who's already got an attitude that Christians are, you know, goody two-shoes and really fakes and phonies. We're, we're not helping them by acting like, oh, you know, if, if you serve God, then everything in life is going to come up roses and you're never, ever, ever going to have a problem. I tell people when I do altar calls that receiving Jesus doesn't mean you're never going to have another problem. Right. Matter of fact, for a while you could have more because the devil's <laughs> going to be yeah. going to be coming after you. But your your worst day with Jesus will still be better than your best day ever was without Him. Because when you have Him, you're never alone. You started bringing up a subject I think earlier too about as you get a little older, you get into the retirement phase ish of your life. Um, you start feeling like you've earned the right to be a little <laughs> more opinion. opinionated. Uh, talk about that for a minute inside the context of uh, authentically unique. Well, people. I heard this statement, and I really like it. You're never truly free until you no longer have a need to impress anyone. I say, I love that. I love that. And at my stage of life, 45 years in ministry, at this point, very successful ministry, I don't need to try to impress anybody. I am what I am and you're either gonna like me or you're not. <laughs> and you know, I believe that God gives me favor, but there's always gonna be somebody that's not going to like you. Right. And so. Um, it's cause they don't know you. Yeah, I, I just think there's so much problem with people comparing themselves with other people, trying to be something that they're not. And it makes them miserable. I mean, I tell all my stories about when God was trying to teach me how to be me. And I had a lady that lived next door to me that was Miss Arts and Crafts. And she made her family's clothes and had a garden and all these things. And I mean, I, Dave had to sew his own buttons on his shirts. I just wasn't good at all that stuff. Oh, and did I, you hear that? 
I tried first, I tried to be like her. I got a sewing machine. I took lessons. And so here I'm sitting and doing something I hate. I hated every minute of it just to prove that I was a normal woman. Mm. And I was normal. I was just my version of normal. Yeah. You know, we don't have to all be like somebody else to be okay. And I think that one of the biggest problems that people have is they just don't like who they are. Mm. Wow. They just do not like themselves. And you can't, you know, I was, when I first started really hearing the word, I kept hearing all these messages about loving people, loving people, loving people, loving people. And I really wanted to, but I just had a hard time doing it. And I couldn't figure out why, because if you really want to do the right thing and you can't do it, so God, what's the problem here? And he said, well, you don't love yourself. Mm. You can't give away what you don't have. Mm. So God loves us first. And then loving yourself in a balanced way really just means accepting God's love. You're just, you're, you're accepting what he's giving you as a gift. And there's so much that God tries to give us that we don't accept. Right standing with him through Christ is another mm. one. How many people spend most of their life feeling guilty when guilt is really just our useless way of trying to pay for our sins when Jesus has already paid for them. Wow. And so mm -hmm. whatever God gives us, it basically does us no good if we won't receive it. So when you receive it, that's when it starts to really work in your life and become real. And we should have the right to be real with each other. I don't have to feel bad because I can't do what you do or I don't look what the way you look, or, you know, whatever the case might be. If somebody is a little bit, weighs a little more than this person, you know, I, we don't have to be jealous of each other. We don't have to dislike somebody because we think they've got something better than us. We don't have to try to be like them. And even in the church setting, you know, I mean, I know we had a woman come to our church and she was an intercessor and she got up every morning at, hmm four and prayed for five hours. And so I said, that's it, man. I'm, that's the key. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get up. And well, I got up and five minutes later, I was asleep on the floor, <laughs> but I'm not going to go tell anybody that. See, you, you just can't do what somebody else is doing. You can only do what God anoints you for. Right. And so I, I think the whole point of this book is for us to have better relationships, but also to be free from all this comparison and trying to be what you're not, and then it, then it gets into people-pleasing, and how often do we do things that we absolutely do not want to do and don't even feel like we're supposed to do just to keep somebody else happy with us? I see uh, in your book you write it this way, which is kind of what you've been talking about over the last few minutes. What others think of you isn't nearly as important as what you think of yourself. Right. Okay. And, um, and that's just knowing that you're loved by God and that he's well, created me this way. And well, okay, let me just ask you a question. Do you like yourself? Most times. <laughs> well, I mean. Yes. But see, there's a difference. I'm not asking if you like everything you do. Right. Okay. I'm asking if you like yourself. Yeah. And see, I don't like everything I do, mm -hmm. but I do like myself. Mm -hmm. And that's, for some reason, that sounds funny to people when you say that. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's this old religious thinking. Well, I'm this terrible person and I'm a worm and I'm no good. And I don't know why people love that, but they don't like it. Mm -hmm. If you like yourself, I was in Pennsylvania one time and I was preaching along these lines and I said, I like myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I spent a lot of years hating myself mm -hmm. and I was miserable, but I like myself because God created me with his own hand in my mother's womb. Yes. The Amplified Bible says carefully and intricately. So what an insult to our creator to not like ourselves. Yeah. If he took that kind of time in creating each one of us uniquely, then the least we can do is show him the respect of liking what he created. But in my sermon, I said, I like myself. The next day it came out in the paper, Meyer says she likes herself. Huh. Well, it was like, Jeez. obviously they didn't like it that I said that yeah. and made it sound like I was full of myself. And that's 
That's not the case at all. I mean, God doesn't want us to hate ourselves. Right. He doesn't want us to be against ourselves. We cannot give away what we yeah. don't have. Yeah. And God expects everything that he gives us. I always say to you and through you. He gives me forgiveness, so I will give forgiveness to other people. Yeah. He gives me mercy so I can be merciful to others. Yeah. He loves me so I can give love to others, but I can't do that if I don't love myself. Yeah, so take that through the back door. If I hated myself, right. hate everything about me, I can't no. love everyone through that. No, and, and, and I yeah. did for years. I hated myself. I hated my voice. I hated this. I hated that. And the whole thing with my voice is funny because now God blasts it all over the the universe, and it is different, it is unique, but because of that, it kind of grabs people's attention. Yeah. I'll be out in the mall and somebody will say that voice. Mm -hmm. I, I, rec I know that. You're Joyce Meyer. Mm -hmm. you, I can't hide because of my voice. Once I open my mouth, <laughs> it's all done and over with. And so I hated my voice, and yet God, did, God knows exactly what he's doing, mm -hmm. and he does things on purpose but we can't make use of the uniqueness that God has given us if we keep trying to be like somebody else. And that goes for men as it much as it goes does. for women. Men just right? won't admit it. Talk about that. Yeah, well. Not you. <laughs> you don't have to say anything. And I'm not picking on you at all because you're great. Male ego, I mean, we all know that it's there. And I think God puts that in men just because of the position that they're supposed to have. They don't want to ever look weak or needy, but <laughs> men, you know, I mean, my husband is a golfer and he would never say this. And I hope he doesn't watch this program. But, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't tell me that if Dave is playing with a bunch of really good golfers and he plays really bad that day, that it doesn't bother him at all. Yeah. Because I know that it, it does. But he would not come home and say, it really embarrassed me. Or, you know, where, w as women, we might say that. But it would be hard for a man to say that. But I think men have a lot of the same problems that women do. It's just that they're less likely to ask for the help to fix it. Mm -hmm. So when I golf <laughs> and, and I completely miss the ball and throw the club in the lake. Right. That's more typical for me in so regard to golf. golfing. Um, <laughs> the takeaway so far, Joyce, is Joyce Meyer likes herself. Okay? I like it. That's the takeaway so far. And we all know people, because it's a common joke, who we say amongst ourselves, maybe to our spouses, that person loves themselves. When do you step over and fall into the ditch from liking yourself and that being appropriate to falling into the ditch and you love yourself? What, Very what's good that like? Answer. I didn't say to be in love with yourself. Mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> I said to love yourself as God's creation. Yeah. I don't love what I do. I may not like everything about, you know, the way I look or, you know, yeah. I, my hair is real baby fine. I would love to have thicker hair so I could do little different things with my hair. But hey, this is what I got, so you got to make yeah. the best out of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not talking about being selfish and self-centered and being in love with yourself and expecting the whole world to revolve around you. I'm talking about a healthy... I'm really just talking about receiving the love of God. Right. And when I say I like myself... I hope and pray that there's a few million people mm. watching that decide, well, yeah, maybe I can, maybe I could do that too. Mm. Beautiful. You know, it's not God's will for people to, God is for you. He doesn't want you to be against you. The devil's against you. Yeah. So when you're always just finding fault with yourself and feeling bad about yourself all the time, the devil loves that. He mm, yeah. makes him and hell, all of hell happy. Yeah. Break down the, in a, a little deeper, the idea of liking yourself, even loving yourself in the appropriate way, and not liking or not loving what you do. How do you separate that in your mind? Well, a long time ago, God gave me this phrase, your who is different than your do. Okay, hang on, let me, <laughs> let me absorb that. Your who 
is different than you. Got it. Okay. okay. Take your own kids. I don't always like everything my kids do. <laughs> but I always love my kids. Yes. Well, God's the same way. He doesn't like everything we do, but we're no surprise to God. He knew everything that we were going to do before he ever invited us into relationship with him. Mm. So he, he kind of is just waiting for what he knows is already going to happen. And he's already decided he's going to forgive us if we're willing to repent. And so if you want to really want to use your faith for something, use it to be free from guilt and condemnation. I suffered so unbearably with, with guilt because of the way I grew up. And I, even though my father was sexually abusing me, somehow the enemy made me think it was my fault. My goodness. And there was something wrong with me. So I had this little record playing in my head most of my life. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? So for me to come to the point, hmm. I mean, for me to come to the point where I can say I like myself and I know that I have faults, and I, but I also know that I love God and that I want to change and that I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. And you, you have to be able to see yourself in Christ. Right. You know, like right now I'm studying holiness. I've been on that kick for two or three weeks. And because we don't hear enough about that. Yeah. The Bible says pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord. So, you know, we've got a lot of, excuse me, sloppy Christianity mm -hmm. today where people tend to think that, you know, because of the grace of God, they can get by with whatever and it's okay. I mean, like, talked to somebody recently in the middle of getting a divorce, living, living with his girlfriend, and he says to this other friend, why don't we fast one day a week for the fruit of the Spirit? I'm like, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're living with your girlfriend you're in the middle of getting a divorce, but, but you think fasting for the fruit of the Spirit is going to help you? Why don't you go back and get the living with the girlfriend thing straightened out mm. <laughs> before you try to do some spiritual exercise that you think is going to help you? So I've been studying holiness yeah. and looking at a book this morning. And see, the Bible says we are holy, that we are sanctified. That's positionally. That's the position that we have with God through Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ, but that's positionally. So we're working, it's like we're working out something that we already have. So God puts all these, it's kind of like when you're born again, he downloads a little bit of everything that he is into your spirit and then the Bible says in Philippians 2, now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, not in your own strength, but with God helping you. So the Holy Spirit comes into our life to help us then take these little seeds that's in our spirit, water them with the word, and little by little begin to manifest what the Bible says you already have. So when I say I am the righteousness of God in Christ, I truly, really am, but that doesn't mean I do everything right. Got it. So you, you got to know the difference in your who and your do. Stop I it. think we need to talk about people pleasing. Okay. Yes. Because we are supposed to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit. Okay. He shows us what to do mm -hmm. and... If we follow that, boy, life is going to really be good. But so often we'll choose pleasing people over doing what we know God wants us to do hmm. or, if you will, even over doing what we want to do. You know, it's like how many people do things and then behind the scenes complain the whole time they're doing it? My goodness. So if you're doing things and you're complaining about it all the time, then guess what? You're not doing it. You're not being authentic. <laughs> you're, not being, you're not being honest with yourself. You're not, you're not doing what you're doing for the right reason, for the right motive. 
And in Corinthians, it says that when Jesus comes, we're all going to pass before him and give an account of our lives. And the works that we've done that were pure works will be rewarded. Mm -hmm. But all the works that were not pure will be burned up in the fire, though you yourself will be saved. Mm -hmm. So we're not saved by our works. Mm -hmm. Our salvation is a settled, done deal. But there are rewards in heaven are the loss of rewards. Wow. And I don't want to lose mine. Right. You know, I don't want to still be in kindergarten when I get there. I want to have the best of everything that God has. So it's really important to me that I do things because I really believe that God wants me to or because I believe it's the right thing to do, not just to keep you from getting mad at me because I'm so afraid of rejection that I let everybody control me just to feel like that I'm being accepted. Can you give me a story in your life where you people pleased and now you recognized it and you don't do that anymore? Well, when I first, my first opportunity that I had in public ministry, I worked at a church and uh, the man that I worked for was 10 years younger than me and we both had our own set of problems and we're still friends and he would say the same thing, but he, uh, he remind, his personality reminded me a lot of my dad in that he was very strong and you just kind of felt like you better do what he wants or, you know, you might be out of here. Well, I so wanted to minister, didn't want to lose my job. So I did a lot of things that, you know, for example, sometimes just being at church too much when I should have said I really need to be home with my family. Mm. You know, there's all kinds of things that if we would just follow our heart, mm -hmm. how good life would be. But when you, when you have the fear of man, the fear of rejection, the fear of being talked about, the fear of what they're going to think, you end up, and we do it sometimes so fast we don't even realize we do it, or we've done it so long we don't even realize we do it. We, we please people to get what we think we want. Mm -hmm. Another example, Dave and I were still in the, uh, we were Lutherans, we were still in the Lutheran church and they had a board of elders. And boy, I wanted my husband to be an elder because <laughs> those were the important people in the church and they were in the know, they knew everything. Well, you had to be in with this certain group if you were ever gonna get asked to do that. So. I, man, I worked and manipulated and pretended to get into this certain group of people. And, you know, however you get your friends, that's the way you're going to have to keep them. Oh, mm. dear. So if, if, you, if, <laughs> you, yeah. if you buy them by doing everything they want, then you'll never be free to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You'll always end up having to do what they want. Well, as soon as I was filled with the Spirit back in the 70s and God called me to teach, they were the first ones to say, we're out of here. Hmm. They, they weren't really my friends. They didn't want me to follow God. They wanted me to follow them. And so, and let me just say this, the longer that you let somebody control you, the harder it is to break that control. So as you listen today, if you're letting someone control you, and I hate that because my father controlled me hmm. and, and I absolutely hated it, but then... I became a controller. It's like the only way that I could live without having fear is if I could control you. And if I couldn't control you and you were stronger than me, then I'd let you control me. And that's, that's not the way God wants us to be. I don't know if you figured it out, Matt, but we're pretty messed up until God, you know. Oh, I, I think to even come to the point where I can understand all that now. Yeah. yeah. You know, because when you're in it, you don't yeah, understand you it. it. Yeah. You're just reacting yeah. and you're doing these things and you're miserable, but you don't know why. Yeah. Joyce, you were doing a lot of that stuff, though, f out of a kind of m potentially at least a good space. You weren't doing it. I mean, you, you did say you did use the word manipulation, but at least you thought that having status at church and this and so you were people pleasing it felt like you were at least out of a good motive or you potentially know, good motive, right? 
God doesn't care anything about status. Yeah. I mean, even if, if I was doing it for status, I was still doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah. Hmm. You know, the thing I should have done is prayed, you know, God, if you want my husband to be an elder in the church, then you make it happen. I shouldn't have been manipulating and pretending and, you know, being phony, trying to make it happen by playing up to all these people that I didn't even like. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't even think we begin to realize how much of that there is in the business world. How, how much yeah. is there of pretending and doing all these things you don't, don't want to do just to get the promotion that you want? Or, or even for believers, how many people will compromise their morals in order to get the promotion that they want? Right. Okay, can I ask you one hard question? Well, I suppose you will. Yeah, I, <laughs> let me just ask you one. This is a, this is a unique one. Uh, we're talking about authenticity and being uniquely you. But if you, it, you have achieved a certain level um, by, first of all, grinding it out, doing a lot of things for the wrong reason. But let's just, let's just say here you are, mm -hmm. and we're sitting here in 2021, uh, hoping for 2022 to come soon. <laughs> uh, and, and we're talking about, Joyce, a, a global ministry. I could, I could blow people's mind with just how many languages your broadcast is on just in India, right. okay? So, you know, and, and the, the number of translations and your books being translated in 135 different languages and all these different accolades, New York Times, number one best selling. So there's a lot of people that want to be you. Okay, so unfortunately, I'm putting the emphasis on you because <laughs> you're old enough to handle it. And you'll give us good issues on this. But I can, you know, spend 15 minutes on Facebook or YouTube and see about a thousand Joyce Meyer wannabes who think that they're called into these things and they think that, you know, they're, th okay. <laughs> How do you differentiate between your manipulation of trying to be the next Joyce Meyer? You know, people, whether you realize it or not, there is a term who is the next Joyce Meyer? Just like there might have been, who is the next Billy Graham? Or right. who is there? Yeah. Okay. Because you've achieved something mm -hmm. that uh, very few have. Um, I'm going to say maybe you're unique in the world to have achieved uh, in, in our sphere, maybe the number one status in, in, in the history of the church. Okay. In, in, in a whole bunch of different categories. So, how do you how do you talk to us about being uniquely somebody else when there's a whole bunch of you know air being sucked out of the vacuum uh, and who is the next Joyce Meyer? Okay, it all comes down to motive. Mm -hmm. And boy, if you want to hear a room get quiet. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just start talking about motives. Oh, man. Because to be honest, we just do. Mm -hmm. We just, we do what will make you happy, and we do what will get us success, and we do what everybody will like. And But most of the time, we don't ever stop long enough to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? All right, God called me into ministry. There's no doubt about that. But for a number of years, my motives for doing what I was doing were anything but pure. I wanted to be popular. Mm. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be well known. I mean, when I was out in public and somebody would recognize me, oh, it would just feel so wonderful, you know. And so God just let me do little things while he was working all that out of me. Got it. And I can honestly tell you now, that just does nothing for me. I mean, I. I know that I know that I know that I'm doing what I'm doing now because it's God's assignment and I want to please him and live for him. Whenever he wants me, I'm ready to go, but I'm happy to do what I'm doing mm. as long as he leaves me here. And 
so these people, the Joyce Meyer wannabes or whoever, a lot of that's out of insecurity. Right. They, they see something that they think they want, but would they want to do what I did to get it? Probably not. Hmm. And that, that's where our mistake comes in at. We see the final end result. And I'll just be honest with you, and I don't want to use bad language on your program. But, I'll go ahead. But Ratings will just improve if I you mean, do. I mean, to be honest, I went through absolute hell to get from where I was to where I am right now. I mean, I had so many problems in my soul. I mean, everything from jealousy to unforgiveness to bitterness to resentment to hatred to controlling, manipulation. I mean, I, anger, I could just go on and on and on. And I can sit here and tell you that God, through his grace and mercy and his word, has worked every one of those Thank things you, out of me. Now, do I ever have a flare up? Yes, I can still get angry. I can still be impatient. But I, as far as I know, I can say with all honesty that I believe right now that everything I, that what I do, I do it only because I believe it's what God wants me to do. I want to please him or because I want to bless somebody. Hmm. You know, I, I mean, say that I want to give somebody something. I don't have to have a three day prayer meeting over whether or not I should. I mean, God told me a long time ago, I won't ever get mad at you if you bless somebody. Hmm. And so, you know, I mean, love is the key. It's the message of the Bible. We don't hear nearly enough about it. Jesus said, one new commandment I give unto you that you love one another and you lay down your own life and you love people. And we should do what we do out of right motives. And I don't think that very many people even stop long enough to ask themselves, why am I doing this? Like you take every person that's watching that would tell you, that they feel like they're about to go crazy because they're so busy. Hmm. You know, I'm too busy. I don't, how could anybody be expected to keep up this schedule? God told me one time, well, you made your schedule. If you don't like it, change it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, it's the truth. Yeah. You know, we, we say yes to all these things yeah. a lot of times for a totally wrong reason. And then obviously there's no anointing there to do them. So we struggle, struggle, struggle. And then we murmur and complain about our schedule, but we're the ones that said yes to all the stuff. Um, I mean, if everybody who thinks they're too busy, if you would take 30 minutes and make a list of everything you're doing and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? You could get rid of three fourths of that list if you would commit to only doing what you believe God really wants you to do. If somebody actually read this book, then there would be no need for the next Joyce Meyer because <laughs> it would be that they would be the next. Themselves. They, they, yeah. they, you know, yeah. they need to be who they are. And But I love mm. the point that you made of going through hell to yeah. get there. <laughs> and I think that's where people want to cop out. They want to hang on to that thing that becomes so familiar, so easy, that habit, that attitude, because that's just the way I am. I was born like this, you know, and they want to excuse. Excuses. Excuses. They want to excuse the bad behavior. They don't want to self-sacrifice. They don't want really to be free. Mm. I think, and your heart, and I like having a Paint brush, brush in my hand to yeah. make a point. <laughs> I may need one of those. Your heart was towards God, and you had to get, you had to be free. You had to set your heart on being delivered and free right. from the bad habits and the bad attitudes and not going back to that place. And I'm sure that's a choice for you maybe every day when you right. wake up that I'm not going to choose to go back there because that's so easy. And I think that's where people, maybe today, that's not preached. Th that 
well, yeah, I, I don't mean that it's not preached. I just think people are too selfish to give what you've done to be free. Well, see, I had to have so your platform many problems, and I kept blaming them on people. I was abused, yeah. but I was abused. If I just wouldn't have been abused, and nobody should have been treated like me. A dog right. shouldn't have been treated like me. Right. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and He said, "You're right. You were treated bad. You were treated wrong, and it was it was not fair. But you don't have to stay that way. Yeah. You can be free, and you can overcome it. But I had to own it. Right." I had to stop blaming it and say, okay, it wasn't my fault, but this is the way I am now. And so I can either keep blaming and stay this way, mm -hmm. or I could say this is wrong and I have a problem with it. And God, please show me how to get out of this and set me free. Let me, let me see if you agree with this just, just for a second. Um, being who you were, which was wrong motives, for most everything you wanted, that was hard and exhausting. Very. Okay. What you're talking about is doing what you're doing for the right reasons, and sometimes what you're saying is, I went through hell, or that must be hard too, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So choose your hard. Yeah, yeah right. That's you what can I... either do it the right way, and that's exactly hard right. sometimes, or you can do it the wrong way, and that's that's hard and exhausting too. Yeah. So choose your hard. Yeah, is I, what you read to me yeah, the other day, which now is kind of like I'm going to get yeah. a T-shirt made with choose hard your to hard. It's hard to stay married. It's hard to get divorced. It, you know, it's hard. Yeah. Choose your hard. Choose your hard. You're exactly hard. right. I preach that. It's like yeah. okay, going forward with God may be hard, but it's not as hard <laughs> as staying where you're at. Exactly. At least. The going forward hard, you're making some progress. Let's talk about the words we speak, because that is so such a big deal right now. It always has been, but right now it's such a, a hot thing. I mean, I, we've all said things that should not have been said. We all, but but just talk a little bit about that, because I know you talk about that in your book. Because being authentic is using words, and sometimes we can take that too far. Well, words are very important. And, you know, there's a couple of different ways you can say the same thing. <laughs> you know, you can use some wisdom in how you say something. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you look terrible in that outfit. <laughs> well, that's not very smart. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, so don't do but that. you can say that differently. That. Never Honey, that. you always look beautiful. Uh, you don't have to say and that. you look good in anything you put on, but I don't think that that really does you justice. I don't think that... Be so, somewhere in the middle there. Yeah, use yeah. some common sense, yeah. which, by the way, is not very common anymore. Right. It's right. like, really, I think that's what wisdom is. Yeah. Wisdom is just sanctified common sense. It's just not being stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, not living stupid, but living with some, some wisdom. And, you know, the Bible has so much to say about our words. I mean, if you just take Proverbs and underline everything it says about the mouth, think before you speak. Don't be... Don't, don't be hasty, don't, don't gossip, don't backbite, you know, all these different things. And social media has become such a nightmare because everybody can just throw their opinion on there. And the, the sad thing is, is people believe everything they read, yeah. whether there's any truth to it or not. Yeah. Hmm. And, not do that. <laughs> you know, words is one of the most important things in our life is saying what God says, not what the enemy says, or even what we want to say, yeah. but God has a good plan for my life. I may not feel like it's going anywhere right now, but God says he has a good plan for my life, so I believe God has a good plan for my life.